friends, we are so glad that you have joined us this beautiful Sunday morning. We are excited to lead you in worship. I'm one of your worship leaders, Laura. I'm Vaughn. I'm Lizzie. And I'm Alex. And we'll be leading you in song today. Let us all sing together wherever you are.
Hello, beloved community. Thank you so much for being here today with us as we gather together wherever we are. I hope you hear these words today that we live into at Mosaic every week. That whoever you are, wherever you are on life's journey, whatever your story or identity, God's grace is here for you. And so are we. So we welcome you to the Mosaic Worship Community at First United Methodist Church of Denton, Texas. And even though we are still in the midst of a pandemic, our church is active, providing care for our community. And if you want to be part of the vision for the upcoming months for our Mosaic service, I'd love to invite you to our worship lead team meeting at 12 p.m. today. We'll put the Zoom link in the comments. We need your voice and vision for how to best serve our community here and now. So I hope you come and be an active part. I'd also love to invite you right now to get your communion supplies ready because today is Communion Sunday. Whatever you have on hand, crackers, juice, maybe some donuts if you're lucky, and join us as we gather around this virtual table together. Lastly, I'd love for you to visit fumcdenton.com slash sign in so we know you are joining us today and don't forget to say hi in the comments because we really miss you. Now, let us light the Advent candle together in community. Friends, today we celebrate the second Sunday in a season which the church calls Advent. It's a time where we prepare for the coming of Jesus into the world, the light of the world. It is no mistake that we celebrate this season at the winter solstice, the darkest time of the season. Just as God always seems to come to us in the darkest night of the soul, God in human form comes in the darkness. This light, this baby, is the great light of hope, not just 2,000 years ago, but here and now, moving in real life through our own hope, courage, strength, and willingness to bring about change in the world. So today, we light this candle as a symbol of that hope which burns within us and the coming extension of that hope, Jesus Christ out of an already Christ-soaked world. O come, O come, oh, Emmanuel, Emmanuel, God, God with, with us.
now to our time of prayer and meditation. Today we are exploring the idea of hope. And to me, hope means believing that things won't stay the same forever. We see that in nature itself. We are headed towards the season of darkness, but we know that the darkness, while maybe painful, cannot and will not last. Isn't that why it's so important that we remember the Christ, the light of the world, coming to us now in the time of darkness, not to vanquish it, not to even change it, but to be here with us through it. We could celebrate the birth of Jesus in the spring, the time of life and birth, or in fall, the time of harvest, or in summer, the season of light. But no, he comes to us now to show us that God's power is the power of withness. Christ joins us to be here with us. He changes us, not the things around us. His power is that of bringing life and good out of the darkest of nights by first living through it. And I think it was Mary herself who was the first to teach withness to Jesus as she carried him, built him with her own body, raised him, loved him, Sometimes we acknowledge Mary as a sort of vessel for Christ coming into the world, but we often imagine her role stopping there. But she was with him throughout his very human life. Jesus showed us what it looks like to be both human and divine, but he could not have been human without Mary's hope and faith and love. Let's pray. Emmanuel, God with us, you showed us, you showed yourself to us in such an unexceptional way. You did not step from the ocean foam fully formed or spring forth from the head of a God as in the Greek stories. You were born. You came into this world through pain and sacrifice. You showed us that the divine is not distinct from the human, from the mess and the pain and the hardships. And you did not grow into a God like we might expect. You did not rule over or control the things around you, but you made friends. You broke bread with the unlikely. You showed us strength and gentleness. You showed us power in serving others. You shared with us a calling towards withness, to be with each other in all seasons of life, to wait in the dark night for the light to come. God, may we find your spirit in us in this season of darkness. Amen.
Welcome to worship on this second Sunday in Advent. I'm Pastor Don Lee. Last Sunday, we began the Advent sermon series, Let There Be Light. This is the message of Advent, even and especially in a time of illness, death, and pandemic. Night is God's nickname for the tohu vabohu, formless nothingness and empty desolation. We all know something about night about the fraying of hopeful situations, of unexpected disappointments, the chaos that threatens to undermine our lives or those of our loved ones. Light is one of the first words God is said to speak. Let there be light. So light comes to symbolize the birth of God among us in Jesus, the light of the world. Things are not always what they should be, so Jesus comes to light the way and in the process conquers the night within us and in our world. Our job as children of light is to let the light God's Spirit has kindled within us shine so brightly that night is driven in today. Let there be light is the Christmas story. Today, hope shines in unexpected places. Amidst empire and the sweep of history, Mary was an unexpected central character in God's liberation story. Her hope, her faith, her courage, and her willingness to play her part were the very responses God used to turn this upside-down world right side up. In today's scripture verse, after receiving an angelic visitation describing how Mary will give birth to God's Son, her relative, Elizabeth, confirms this prophetic word, causing Mary to erupt into a song of praise. Our scripture reading is Luke chapter 1, verses 46 through 55. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill her pro his promises to her. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is His name. His mercy extends to those who fear Him. 
from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. The Unremarkable. Have you ever been totally underwhelmed by something? I remember my first trip to Wichita Falls. And I kept thinking those must be some pretty spectacular waterfalls to earn the city's moniker. I don't mean to offend any Wichita fallers, but they ain't much to look at. Hashtag totally underwhelming. At best, a couple steps above the water effects of my neighbor's pool. Talk about unremarkable. Mary, the main character of our scripture reading, could also be described as unremarkable. The second most important person in the narrative of God's sweeping salvation story is a young teen from a small backwater town in a backwater country, first century Middle East. We know little about Mary's story, her childhood, her parents, her hopes and dreams, her fears and or failures. She is likely 14 years of age the traditional marrying age of women in that culture. Mary is engaged to a man named Joseph, twice her age. And we know that according to an angelic vision, Mary has found favor with God and thus is chosen to be the mother of Jesus. There is one other thing we do know about Mary. Her song of praise recorded in today's scripture reveals a depth of faith and maturity that goes beyond Mary's years. Some scholars suggest that she's borrowing verbiage from her faith tradition. As the saying goes, there is nothing new under the sun, hence the revival of the station wagon. Should have ordered it with optional wood paneling. Okay, boomer. Mary's Magnificat, as her song has come to be known, shares similarities to other songs in the Old Testament, including the Song of Miriam, Exodus 15, the Song of Deborah, Judges 5, and the Song of Hannah, Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. If you were to try to hone down the themes in all four, perhaps the one most shared theme is God's hesed, steadfast faithfulness to the promises God makes. God's hesed, i.e. God's faithfulness in keeping God's promises, is part and parcel of Mary's faith tradition. Nothing new in that. The real surprise is how Mary herself factors into the fulfillment of God's promise. I'm sure the same is probably true for all of us. It's not surprising that God acts to fulfill God's promises. It's just surprising that God would do so through you and I. I'm always blown away when someone tells me I've been an important part of their faith journey. And yet it is God's modus operandi to use everyday people like you and me to accomplish God's purpose. How else would FUMC Denton continue to do millions of dollars worth of ministry if it wasn't for the faithfulness of every person who gives sacrificially to its ministry? How could we minister to thousands if our members didn't step up to lead Sunday school, serve as confirmation leaders and uh, adult workers with youth or hold babies in the nursery? Recently at Share the Harvest, we had 680 cars drive through holding as many as three or four and in some cases as many as 10. And we handed out over 1,300 bags of candy. One car came all the way from Arlington. Those numbers easily put us well above a couple thousand attendees. God can use the most unremarkable to do amazing things. Anyone here unremarkable? Not today. Verse 48, the Lord has looked with favor on the lowliness of God's servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. The unexpected. Mary's story is played out against a backdrop of empire, a, a time when the imperial cult of Rome with his emperor, Tiberius Caesar, demanded obeisance, tribute, and adorations from conquered states like Israel. Suffice it to say, Mary's 
strikes an unassuming challenge to Rome. What possible threat could a young Middle Eastern teenager from the other side of the tracks be to the empire of Rome? One of the constants in the Bible is how God uses rather unlikely people to accomplish God's purpose. We see this time and again. It almost seems as if God looks for people who don't have their act together or who are flawed, sometimes fatally. I mean, think about it. Sarah was nearly a hundred and barren. Noah was a drunk. Jacob was a deceiver and a cheat. Samson, a rogue and brutal thug. Queen Esther, an orphaned Jew, hiding her true identity. Moses and David were murderers. Rahab was a prostitute. Mary was just a kid. The one thing they all have in common, they said yes to God when asked. Says Mary, may your word be fulfilled. Throughout God's salvation story, we are told that God often uses the most unlikely of people to accomplish God's story of salvation, which of course means we all have a potential role in God's salvation story if we have the faith, courage, and willingness to participate in it. Amidst empire and the sweep of history, Mary is an unexpected central character in God's liberation story. God is at work in the world, often in small, unremarkable ways we don't notice, and in the least expected of ways. Like a baby born in a backwater town known as Bethlehem. A six-year-old named Ruby Bridges who walks to school challenging the segregated and racist status quo. Or in the case of our scripture, through a young teenage mother with nothing truly unique or outstanding about her. What possible threat could a young pregnant teen be to the power of Rome? She will be married off, forced to leave her home and family. She will give birth to her firstborn in an animal stable smelling of livestock. Mary will flee with child and husband in tow to a foreign land and live under the threat that someday her family will be hunted down and the child killed. They will live in the obscure and nondescript town of Nazareth, and yet, Mary is very much a threat, an unexpected one, obviously, but still a threat to the power of Rome. How? Mary's hope, her faith in God, her courage to accept her role, and her willingness to play the role that God has given her in the nativity are the very things that God needs. These are God's tools for turning this upside-down world right side up. She says yes, and her song makes possible the music of Jesus's life. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Verses 44 through 47. Mary's song known as the Magnificat, Latin for my soul magnifies the Lord, is a reminder that our role is to magnify, glorify God our Savior, and to augment the salvation work God is doing in the world. And finally, where are you in this story? I was talking to a group of children in chapel, pre-pandemic, and I held up a, a wood carving of Noah's Ark. Its deck was filled with animal cutouts, and I asked the children, who is on the Ark with Noah? And several chimed in at the same time saying, Jesus. Now I've been in the church a long time, and I figured out that Jesus is always the right answer. But I think the question, where are you in this story, is a good question to ask whenever we read the stories of our faith, because they only speak to our lives when we find a way to place ourselves in them. And so I ask you, where are you in this story? I think one of the ways that we find ourselves in this story is how we experience God's hesed, God's steadfast faithfulness in our lives. How has God been there for you, delivered you, and giving you hope in the midst of despair? What is our role in magnifying God in the everydayness of our lives? Like Mary, we all have a role to play in God's purpose. God's coming is dependent on our willingness to play our part. While I was working on this sermon, I noticed a book in my home library on the shelf titled The Book of Me, subtitled A Do-It-Yourself Memoir. Now, I'm not sure who in my family received this as a gift, but what is notable about the book is that its pages are empty. 
And why we own an empty book is, is not clear to me, but I do believe that in some respect we are all writing our own memoirs by the decisions we make or refrain from making, how we use our time, our money, our resources, what we prioritize, and so on. And from what I know of God, the divine intent is that as we write our own book of me, that its pages be filled with the story of God, so that anyone reading it may find a message of hope shining in unexpected places. Just as Mary's eyes are opened when Elizabeth confirms what Mary has envisioned, so may our eyes be open to the reality of God's hesed, God's faithfulness in fulfilling what God has promised. For us, it may feel like we are being swept along, but Advent reminds us of the great light of hope, that God is moving in real life. And our hope and our faith and our courage and our willingness to play our part are the very things that God uses to change the world. Pray with me. Oh God, open our eyes to your faithfulness in our lives. Open our minds to say yes to our role in your purpose as we open our hearts to sing you praise. Hallelujah. Amen. As we enter into this Advent season, I know it feels a little strange. We can't be with the ones we love around hot cocoa and Christmas trees and for me, usually lots of carbs, but we can still be in community together and gather around the table to remember the presence of Christ in the world through the bread and the cup. So today, as you get your communion supplies ready, I wanna ask you how you can be the presence of Christ in the world right here and now. One way to do this would be to give to our ministry partners for our special Christmas offering, helping our ministries in Russia and Honduras, as well as providing free and affordable legal aid and advocacy for our immigrant neighbors here in Denton and the DFW area. To find out more about our Christmas offering, you can visit fumcdenton.com slash Christmas. Now, friends, let us once again gather at the table and receive the real presence of Christ, the light of the world. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took the bread, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples saying, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in his final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. And so we pray as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may now partake in the elements of bread and juice, the body and blood of Christ. Hello, friends. As we continue our worship, we come now to a time where we give the gifts God has bestowed us to assist those in our community, in our church, and to continue to be in relationship with other churches and missions that we are in partnership with. You can give by sending a check to our church, or you can go to fumcdenton.com slash give. Let's continue our worship by being together in song, for we are never alone.
Hi friends, my name is Crystal and I'd like to share a few opportunities to connect this holiday season. Tonight at 5 p.m., join us for our Las Posadas service outside here on our church campus. The story of Christmas is an immigration story, one with much seeking, traveling, and searching for a safe place of refuge. We will travel together around the church to different doors, each representing a different posada. We will sing along the way and hear stories from characters representing people from all over the world. Please wear a mask and bundle up if it's cold. We look forward to journeying with you. You can also join us next Sunday night, December 13th, for an outdoor candlelight evening prayer service at 5 p.m. and the following Sunday, December 20th, for our outdoor longest night service where we will create a sacred space for those of us living through dark times right now. Bring your own lawn chair, blanket, or sturdy legs, and let us worship together with candlelight. You can see all of our Advent and Christmas events in one place at fumcdenton.com Christmas. And as always, if you'd like to learn more about who we are, please visit us online at fumcdenton.com beliefs. If you're interested in becoming a member, we invite you to visit fumcdenton.com slash membership. Receive this blessing. As we each write our own book of me, may its pages be filled with the story of God so that anyone reading it may find a message of hope shining in unexpected places. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen.